All right. Am I on the microphone? Okay. So hi, everyone. Welcome for stopping by. Thanks for being here. 10 a.m. Thursday, after all those parties last night. Um, I'm Bob Deschutte. Um, I'm a professor, a Belgian professor, actually, and I, I work at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Um, and this talk is actually all going to be about this guy. Me. Um, yeah, get ready for the most egoistic talk you've ever heard on an advocacy track. Except, well, I'm not going to talk about this guy specifically. Um, I'm actually going to talk about the 65-year-old version of me. The guy to, who, according to the internet, will look like this. And I'm, I'm kind of happy with that, you know. Um, I get to keep my hair. That's not too bad. Um, but um, he is actually seriously frustrated, though, um, with the games that are being marketed towards him and his senior friends. So he traveled back in time, you know, um, to tell me about um, doing this talk and changing the future. So that's why I'm here, GDC. Let's change the future together. Are you with me? Yes. All right. So let's talk about um, designing games that are meaningful to an older audience. Um, and that also means that we're going to have to address ageism or the unfair treatment and stereotyping of people based on their age. Um, and how we can move past that as game designers. Now, before I do that, just a really quick clarification. What am I talking about here, really? I mean, older audience, what does that mean, older adults? Um, is that senior citizens? Is that retired people? Well, the actual age range that I find in the literature differs from author to author. So I'm just going to go with the average, and that means that I'm going to have to apologize to everybody over 50 here in the audience, because you are a part of my demographic. I know. Um, even if you're still a very young older adult. <laughs> but moving on, let's start with the opening question here. Older adults and video games, why is this relevant? Why is this even worth your time, right? Well, because of this. Um, older adults will become one of the largest groups of gamers, which is a fairly bold statement, I know. Um, I'm sure that some of you did not see that coming, and I know that I didn't see that coming 15 years ago when I started to do my research in this field. So let me uh, frame it a little bit and explain where I get this from. So here's an overview of the Entertainment Software Association's uh, statistics, the annual facts about the gaming industry. I'm sure you've seen these before. Um, they state that 27% of US gamers is currently over the age of 50, and the average US gamer's age is 35 years old, which are some pretty high numbers. Um, of course, we, we're not really talking about what kind of games these people play yet, or these puzzle games, or these AAA games, so just think games in the most general sense of the word. Um, but it is a high number. And, and it is a number that has been confirmed by other studies. For example, um, on the left, I've got the, the Pew Research Study from 2008. And Pew is a nonpartisan think tank in Washington, DC. So it means that they have reliable data that's not associated with politics or with, well, video game publishers. Um, their study found that 40% of 50 plus year olds in the US play games, and that about 23% of 65 plus year olds uh, do the same. If you look at this globally, on European soil, the Interactive Software Federation of Europe, um, as well as some other sources report um, similar numbers that are also pretty high, um, even though they are lower than the ones in the US. For Asia, I don't really have that many numbers, but the IGEA uh, has partnered up with Bond University in 2015, um, and they also published some numbers that are actually really high. Um, for example, 51% of people between 55 and 64 play games, and 41% of people over 65 play digital games in Australia. Um, so pretty high numbers. And if you put all of that together, I think it's, it's reasonable to say that this is a large demographic, a large group of people worldwide. Um, so that's one of the reasons why games for older adults are relevant today. A lot of them are playing as of right now, as of today. Um, now, here's a different statistic, though. This is what our age pyramid looks like right now. Um, and this is what it will look like um, by 2050. Notice how top heavy it is becoming. That's because by 2050, about a fifth of um, the world population will be over 60, which is approximately twice the amount that it is today. So our population is aging rapidly as well. Now, if you take these, these figures that are from uh, the United Nations, um, and you put them together with some of the statistics that we talked about earlier, say the ones from the, the Pew Research Center, um, you can do some calculations and get some absolute numbers. For example, um, right now, I would estimate we get to about 26 million US gamers um, between 50 and 64, 11 million that are older than 65. Putting those together, we get 37 million US gamers over 50, which is approximately 29% of US gamers being over 50. 
Um, and that's actually higher than the numbers that the Entertainment Software Association have published earlier. Uh, but still, it's in the same ballpark. Um, but the most important thing here is that, well, this is um, a lot of people. If this is correct, then there are more 50-plus-year-old US gamers than the entire population of Canada. Uh, wow, yeah. Um, but that's today. <laughs> Let's do a projection and look at the future. So if you look at the future, you know, there's always going to be some things that change. So you want to look into making some, some scenarios uh, for your simulation. So my first scenario is, let's say these percentages stay the same. Um, for example, we know that 23% of 65 plus year olds are currently playing. Let's assume that this percentage will remain the same 30 years from now, still 23% of 65 plus year olds. Then your numbers will look like this. We go from 37 million to 46 million which is around 33% of US gamers, and that's a, a really nice number. Um, at this point in time, we would be looking at a group of people that is roughly the same size as the entire population of Spain. And Spain is actually a top 30 country in the world in terms of population. Um, now, to me, though, this doesn't make sense at all. Um, it would make a lot more sense for me if these numbers would change, because today's 65 plus year olds, they didn't grow up with video games in the same way kids today do. I mean, they weren't hooked on esports when they were in college, for example. Um, so, what would make more sense to me is if the people who have been playing, to some extent, keep playing. Um, and that's scenario two. Say the 60% of 30 year olds that are playing today are the 60% of um, 50 plus year olds 20 years from now. And that's scenario two, the young gamers of today become the old gamers of tomorrow, and that basically looks like this. We would end up with 105 million US gamers over 50, 30 years from now. And that would equate to about 43% of US gamers being older adults, um, which is a very big number in comparison to the, 20, the 27 we mentioned earlier. And that would, you know, if we're gonna keep playing the population game, that would be Spain and Italy combined, or Belgium 10 times if you want. We're a very small country. Um, anyway, so if you think about tomorrow's gamers, I want you to be thinking about these guys. Um, now, of course, these were just some fantasy demographics, um, and we need to take a lot more into account. Because scenario two, the 105 million people that I was just referring to, that kind of assumes a couple of things. It assumes that older adults will be physically and mentally able to play games. It will assume that games still fit into their lives. Um, it also assumes that they're still interested in playing games. So that really brings me to what the main question um, that I'm hoping to address in this session is. So how can we make that happen, GDC? How can we earn 105 million people um, over the age of 50 playing games 30 years from now? And the answer to that question is straightforward. Um, you make games that are meaningful to them. And the key to doing that has two parts to it. First, it's a matter of accessibility. Second, it's a matter of um, providing great content. Now, this talk is mainly gonna focus on the latter, um, on the content part, because that's what my own work happens to be mostly about, and there's a whole lot of really good accessibility sessions at the GDC as well. Um, however, I do wanna take five minutes to just briefly give you my two cents regarding accessibility, because I feel it's, de it's definitely that important. So let's explore the same question that we had at the beginning. Why should you care about this? Why should you care about accessibility for older adults? The answer to that is fairly simply, well, um, it's because this could be you. And it doesn't really matter how healthy you are right now. There will come a day in your life in which you will have some sort of an age-related disability. And this might prevent you from um, using a gamepad, from hearing the audio cues in the game, from seeing the action on screen properly, or you might not even be able to turn on your console without the help of a caregiver. Just think about that. Um, so there's really no way around this. Um, to put it in the words of Ralph Baer, um, who I'm sure you know as the father of the modern video game, there is a need for creating games that can be played by a more physically challenged aging segment of the population. Because we all want to keep playing games in our later lives. You, me, Ralph Baer. Unless, unless, of course, you don't like to play games, you know, maybe you're the kind of person who doesn't use your own product, and I guess that's fine, that's fair. But even then, you want to care about accessibility. Just think about um, making games for people with color blindness. Uh, it's a pretty simple modification to change the colors in your games, and all of a sudden, you have 30 million more people that are able to play your game. 30 million more people. That's a lot more copies that you can sell. So what about age-related disabilities, then? Well, 
I put together a slide that pretty much sums it up. 36% um, of 65-plus-year-olds reported disability to the 2013 survey of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, today, that would be approximately 40 million people. Now, this is actually a pretty low number, again. Um, I've seen surveys that report up to 50% uh, of 65-plus-year-olds, and of course, these are registered disabilities. You might have some issues that prevent you from um, playing the games that you love, you know, reduce sight, movement, hearing, um, that definitely impacts your gaming, but it's not necessarily a disability yet. It's not in those statistics yet. So um, let's just have this sink in. I mean, how great would it be to increase your audience by 36%, especially considering that this is the low number? Um, so let's talk a little bit about how, what you should do to achieve that. Let's talk a little bit about accessibility and, 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 and aging briefly. Um, and I'm happy to say that there's actually an amazing resource out there for you. There is um, the IGDA Accessibility Special Interest Group. Um, they're meeting tomorrow in North Hall. And they have this excellent website, gameaccessibilityguidelines.com, that I really recommend. Between these two resources, you will cover so much ground. You'll get all the information that you need and much, much more than what I have time um, to share with you today. Nevertheless, I'm going to give you a really brief, ready-to-photograph overview slide on um, accessibility guidelines for older adults. And this is really a summary um, that the academic community has published through much, uh, many, many papers, many, many different authors. Um, and some of these things are really obvious. For example, make your fonts bigger. I think that's probably one of the first things people think about when they think about making games for older adults. Um, slow down the pace. Give them a way to slow down the pace. Others are less obvious. Um, for example, avoid high frequencies in hearing or adjust the amount of words that your characters are saying. Um, makes a big difference. It's, it, it matters. But most importantly, when you look at this slide, I don't think this really has to cost, cost that much money to implement. It shouldn't cost you a fortune. And I don't think that it should influence your game design all that much. You can still make the game you want to game that you want to make and uh, be aware of this. And that brings me to my three specific design recommendations for accessibility. Um, the first one is, well, it's going to be very difficult to do that entire list, obviously. It's a long list. Um, but every little bit that you do helps. Remember the, the example that I just talked about with the colorblindness, 30 million people, and it's just one thing that would be on the list. Um, second, if you want to implement these things, you want to implement them at the very beginning of your design process. It is going to get expensive if you're going to have to do it at the very end, and you're going to have to change over a whole bunch of things that you've already been working on. Um, but if you start with it in the beginning, you know, you're trying to think of how, how you're going to implement a certain game mechanic, that's when you want to start thinking about accessibility. And then finally, um, while age-related adjustments are necessary, I think they are often personalized from, from my experience with working with older adults. And a lot of the things that I mentioned um, were things that you would typically find in the options menu, in the settings menu of a game, right? So I feel that it's fair to say that a lot of it is about adjusting interface design. Um, and that's good, because um, that means that you don't really have to touch the challenge all that much. Because older adults, the ones that I've worked with, actually still want to be challenged. It's not about making things too easy for them in any way. Um, and I've seen this a lot in the observations that I do, and I'm just going to share a quick story with you guys. And the video is working. Um, so I will never forget how a 70-plus-year-old man just obliterated me at Trackmania. And that's what Trackmania looks like when you're playing this, all right? So if you're unfamiliar with this, I mean, this, this doesn't look easy. This, this is a difficult game. It's all about reaction speed. It's perceptual speed, spatial awareness. It's not specifically designed for older adults, as far as I'm aware. Um, but that didn't stop this guy. You know, he just kept practicing. He persevered. And he got really good at it. I mean, I'm not bad at racing the games. I mean, don't get me wrong here. Um, but he just kept practicing, and he beat the entire uh, game at the golden level. So older adults persevere. And it doesn't always have to be a flashy game like Trackmania. Um, there's a lot of um, research out there that um, looks at how older adults play games. And I think Wii Bowling is one of the more typical ones that you'll see. Um, and all these studies have a similar story. It starts with we brought Wii Bowling into this retirement community, and they struggled with it. 
Um, but they did it as a group, and they just wanted to uh, figure out how this works. And even though they're struggling, they practice, they practice, they persevere. And then they get a hang of it. And well, the people in this picture actually turn into a leak. Um, and then you see all these benefits that, I've, that I'm sure you've heard of in the media. There's more social interaction. There's better general physical health. And there's increased self-esteem. And there are lots and lots of examples of how older adults want good challenges and how they will persevere if you present them with one, as long as the interface allows for them to do this. So those are my two cents, or three cents, if you will, on um, accessibility. Um, and please check out the website that I mentioned earlier, because there's so much more to this story. Um, but anyway, let's get back to the original question here. Um, and let's talk a little bit about content, because we need some work there as well. Um, so here's a simple question. What content are older adults actually playing today, right? Do we have some statistics on this? And yes, we do. Um, thanks to Nick Yee and his team at quanticfoundry.com. <laughs> um, you might have heard of these guys. They've been going viral a little bit. And um, they have done this gamer personality survey. Uh, it's, it's a short survey, some quick questions about the things that you think are important when you play games, the things that you think are really enjoyable when you play games. And it will tell you how you are positioned in relation to these six motives um, that you see on the screen right now, from action to creativity. So that's really cool. You know, it, it tells you something about what kind of gamer you are, and, and it gives you some other games that you might be interested in. But the best part of doing a survey like this is that it's very motivating to fill out this survey. It gives something back to you. It gives you juicy feedback. Um, and that's why they already gathered more than 144,000 participants. And well, for academics like me, that's just that's just a dream. That's a really nice sample. Um, now, unfortunately, their report on games and older adults is behind the paywall. But I contacted them, and they were so kind to just let me show you the tip of the iceberg. So let's look at older adults in their sample, and let's start with the platform preferences. So for 50-plus-year-olds, PC reigns supreme. It's, it's the biggest and most popular platform. Um, when we're looking at consoles and handhelds, uh, well, not handheld consoles, but consoles come in third, and um, tablets and mobile devices come in second. Now, of course, I'm sure that you've uh, figured this out, but these images are mainly illustrative. Um, I have no idea how many people play Neo Geo over 50. I'm sure the number is lower than 25%. Um, but you know, I didn't want to put all the consoles on there. <laughs> um, so anyway, that is the platform preferences. Um, Let's look at the games that they prefer to play. All right. So in third place, for female gamers over 50, uh, we have Second Life. Uh, third place for male gamers over 50, we have Microsoft Solitaire. Uh, second place for female players, we have Glitch. Um, I don't think Glitch is that well known, so for the people that have never heard of Glitch, it's um, a creative 2D browser-based multiplayer, well, MMORPG, I can say that here, I'm at the GDC. Um, but it's, it's not about hack and slash, it's not about violence, it's more about creativity and building up this world in, uh, to do any, uh, in 2D. And it's actually been so popular that even though it's been discontinued, the community is building their own version of it right now. Um, so that's Glitch. I, I recommend looking it up. It's, it's, it's a fascinating case. Um, second place for men, second life again. And then we get the first place for female players over 50. It's Farmville. Um, <laughs> and for men, it's Railroad Tycoon. Now, you see some numbers pop up underneath there. Let me explain how these works, because they're not just frequencies or something. Um, what Quantic Foundry does is they compare the prevalence of these games uh, in relation to the average. So to make this really simple, the way you should read those numbers is, um, for men over 50, it is 25.8 times more likely for them to mention Railroad Tycoon than it is for the average player in the sample. So, and these come from questions that ask them about what are your top favorite games of all times and which are the games that you recently enjoyed playing. So it's, it, it's a relative measure, if you will. But in general, it's a very clear message, I'd say. Um, for female players, we see um, two motives. We see that um, older women prefer games that have them collect stars and do the completion thing. Um, and that allows for creativity and self-expression, like I was talking about with Glitch. Um, for older men, it's games with strategy and experimentation or exploration. And these findings, um, it's only one study. I'll, I'll back it up with some more findings. They're actually in line with what academic quantitative research had to say about these groups as well. Um, in Celia Pierce's study with 300 baby boomers in 2008, she found that the PC was a platform of choice. 
And her findings are that um, the, her sample preferred adventure role-playing online games, so Glitch, Second Life would fit in there. Um, intellectual challenges and less reflexes, so Railroad Tycoon, Solitaire. And a sense of escape to other worlds, again, Second Life and, and Glitch fit that really well. Farmville might even fill that for some people. I personally did a survey like that as well with 214 people. Um, again, PC is the most popular platform. Uh, in my survey, we saw that 80% preferred casual games, 20% preferred hardcore games. Um, challenge is the most important motive here. Um, I was already talking about how, how important challenge can be, which comes from qualitative research, but you also saw it in the quantitative data. Um, and if you want to keep people playing for a longer time, it's about social interaction, which I don't think is a very new thing. You see that with younger audiences as well. Um, However, the final thing that I've got to share about that is the reported motivation to play is actually much lower than it is for younger audiences. And that is actually really interesting. I felt that was really uh, important. Because that means that the research shows that older adults are less motivated to play games. Um, and it's not just me. Um, the study from Nikki that I mentioned earlier with more than 100,000 people noticed exactly the same thing. The motivation profiles go down. So why would that be? And that's actually a really tough question to answer if you're doing quantitative survey-based research. Um, but there's a lot of qualitative research out there as well with older adults that um, are studies in which uh, researchers have talked to older adults and tried to figure out why they play games. And I have plenty of stories of my own, but you know I don't want to do a research bias here, so I'm going to go with a quote from Celia Pierce's paper again. Um, and in this quote, we learn two things. Um, first of all, if there's one thing that our, this audience agrees on, it's that there's a lack of attention of the mainstream uh, game industry to their interests. Second, even the people who really love to play games still feel that, well, they're kind of formulaic. They're derivative. They're, there's too much, it's too much about these fancy graphics and not enough innovation. Um, so even, and that's even the older adults that love to play games. So I would argue that this actually has a lot to do with the content issue that I was referring to earlier. And it's not my opinion. I mean, it's the opinion of the people that I have worked with in my research projects, my, the participants of my studies. So that brings me to the second point that I want to talk about. Let's drop the A-bomb here, ageism. Um, because if you think about games for older adults, what really comes to mind? It's all about brain training games and embodied fitness games. And there are some things wrong with that. Um, First of all, um, it's because, well, this is a consensus from the scientific community on brain training games. At this point in time, we don't really have compelling scientific evidence to date that this actually works. Um, and this is signed by a lot of extremely well-respected um, names in the field, and many of these people would actually directly benefit if they did have this evidence, you know, because there's a lot of consultancy money for these neuroscientists and psychologists, uh, psychologists out there. Um, of course, Brain games have been uh, successful at selling copies, but then again, you're selling copies based on the idea that people are scared of growing old and getting Alzheimer and that kind of stuff. And you know, that's so terrifying that you'd buy anything. Um, in my research, I've talked to so many older adults about uh, brain games and, and, and fitness games, and most of the time, they're pretty disillusioned by them, um, simply because um, they don't really perceive a clear effect, especially with the brain games. And the games themselves are really not that fun. So it's two things that they were expecting, and they don't even get like half of those things out of it. And that's probably why, if we looked at the study from Quantic Foundry, none of the top six games that I just shown you guys is actually a brain game or a health game. And in the longer list, you know, well, get the study and you can see for yourself. Anyhow, um, regardless of the effectiveness of these uh, games, though, there's another issue that I have with it. Um, because both brain games and health games are, put, are putting out some pretty messed up rhetoric, in my opinion. Um, the message that these things are telling you is that, as an older adult, you should care about being young again. Uh, because after all, you know, you're, you're not really a contributing member to society anymore if you're no longer young. And, you know, how messed up is that? Uh, think about it. I mean, how would you feel if every game that is made for you out there stereotypes you and pushes you, uh, and pushes forth these artificial materialistic ideas? How awful would that be? Well, I guess every female gamer in the audience knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so for me, health games for older adults that are only about these external outcomes, uh, I have nothing against health games in general, but if it's only about the external outcomes, it falls in a similar category as, as ping games. One thing is sexist, the other is ageist. Um, but anyway, let's look at this from a positive angle. Um, how can we move beyond this? How can we move past this? Um, 
I feel that we need to design games that are truly fun to play for older adults. We need meaningful play experiences, not gamified training exercises. Um, play is about happiness, people. It's about positive psychology. It's about self-cultivation. It's about having fun. There are senior playgrounds being built all over the world, like the one that you see on the slide, and that's the mindset that we as game designers need to incorporate when we talk about games and aging. You all know how important it is to play when you grow up. You want your kids to play because they learn so much. Well, it's just as important to, to do this when you are growing old. It activates your mind, your body, it, it, it's so good for you. And you shouldn't need an ulterior motive to do this. If, you're, if you need an ulterior motive to play, you're doing it wrong, basically. So let's get talking about uh, the content, and um, I'll share my design recommendations with you. So first off, we've got to use Geronto aesthetics to appeal to older adults. Um, and I'm sure nobody has any idea what that's about right now, so let me explain that. Um, Geronto refers to old age, as I'm sure you're aware. And aesthetics is a term that I borrowed from Robin Hunick and Mark LeBlanc and Ro uh, Robert Subek, uh, who are the authors of the MDA framework that you might have heard about if you've gone to the gameplay workshop at GDC. Um, I think since the turn of the millennium, they've been uh, teaching this on Tuesday and Monday at this very conference. And it stands for Mechanics Dynamic Aesthetics. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, aesthetics are the intended emotional experience that you look for when you're designing a game. That's why it's pictured closer to the player uh, on my slide than to the designer. The player is in control of their emotional experiences, of their aesthetics. However, as a designer, you want to envision these experiences at the beginning of your design process, and you want to build your mechanics in a way that they will lead to these extended, uh, intended emotional experiences. For example, say you want your player to feel challenged, you might design some clever puzzle mechanics. Now, the authors of MDA provide a list of aesthetics that you can shoot for. Um, things like sensation, um, the player's senses are stimulated by the game and they feel sensation. Fantasy, you indulge yourself in a fantasy world. Narrative, um, awesome stories, cool characters, challenge, um, interesting conflicts to overcome, and they have a bunch more. And the list is not exhaustive, um, because human experiences are obviously much more than what you could put on a slide. And these are pretty great, though. Um, but they are focused on a general audience, so that's where the Geronto aesthetics come into play. Geronto aesthetics expand this list to include older adults' needs and wishes based off research, and there's six of them. So let me share those with you. The first three were identified with non-playing older adults. Um, so there's cultivation, or playing games uh, for personal growth. Say you're playing Rome Total War or Civilization V because you want to learn more about history and ancient warfare. Excuse me. Second, there's contribution, or playing games to give something back to society. Um, you might help out your clan, your young new clan members, your noobs, uh, in, a, in an MMORPG or something. Um, and, well, this is something that I've rarely seen working with younger adults, in, uh, with, with younger audiences in, in game research. Then there's connectedness, um, or Playing games is a shared experience, and the key word is with cherished people. So say you and your son love to play Hearthstone together because it gives you something that you um, can do together, that you can spend time with together, and that you can bond over. So those are the first three. They come from non-playing older adults. The second three come from actively playing older adults. First off, I've got compensation. Um, so playing games because they replace other activities that are no longer available to you. Remember the age-related decline that I was talking about? You might not be able to play soccer anymore because your knees are just not good. Um, or, well, I'm in the US here. Let's say American football. So then you play Madden um, to compensate for that and to get back a feeling of, of uh, interacting in that kind of a sport that you've loved all your life. Then there's contemporaneity, which means that you play games to keep up with the times. Say you are playing a new virtual reality game, the latest, greatest, cutting-edge thing that comes out. It's all in function of you still being relevant. And that's something that a lot of older adults um, use to decide what game that they're going to pick out. Finally, there's nostalgia, or playing games as a conduit to the past. Um, so you might play this World War II game because you were a little boy or a little girl uh, during it, or your parents uh, lived through the Second World War. So all of these six things, if you add them to your existing game mechanics, uh, will help you to appeal to older adults. And unintentionally here, there's already a whole bunch of positive outcomes embedded in them. For example, nostalgia is all about reminiscing. And there's so much research out there on how reminiscing leads to positive health outcomes um, and, and, and better health. So anyway, um, use these to appeal to older adults um, and embed them in your aesthetics. Second recommendation. Design for context. 
because context becomes more and more important the older you get. Um, so let me show you what I'm talking about with that one. This is a player classification that we designed for older adults based on a bunch of studies. Um, and um, we basically use contextual motivation, which is you are motivated because of the content of the game. Contextual motivation, you're motivated because of the context in which you play the game. And then there's pleasure versus usefulness. Pleasure about the fun of the game, usefulness, does this game do anything else for me outside of the game? All right? Um, and that has um, led to these five player types. So let's start in the bottom right corner. The first group are called the time wasters. They play because there is temporarily nothing better to do. Um, they might be waiting for their son to come online um, on Skype or something, and they're just playing this quick little puzzle game that they can turn off whenever they like. As a result, they're playing just for some diversion. There's nothing better to do, and that's based off their context. However, these are very serious people most of the time, and they want to spend their time in a very useful way. God forbid that they would do something unproductive with their days. So they end up playing these puzzle games, Sudokus, or, or adaptations of traditional games, because they're not very much in touch with gamer culture at all, um, and they look for things that are just very familiar. So that's the first group, the time wasters. If we go to the far left and the bottom, we find the freedom fighters. Freedom fighters play in function of freedom of choice, of autonomy, of uh, relaxation, and living your life on your own pace. These are the people that want to live the good life. Because they've worked for a boss all their lives, they had to come out of bed whenever their job told them to, and now they're retired and they're done with all that kind of stuff. They're like, I'm playing whatever I want now, and I don't care uh, if people approve of this or not. So it's contextual motivation as well. They play to get away from other activities. Um, but they don't care about what society thinks about that. It's just all about fun. If, you know, if they're learning something, it doesn't really matter. So what games do they choose? They choose games that are about instant gratification. Um, if not, they switch to something else. So they love PopGap, for example. They'll play Bejeweled. They'll play Plan uh, Plants vs. Zombies, and so on. Then we get to the middle, and that's where we find the compensators. Compensators are similar to time wasters because they are playing... Um, due to other activities not being available. There's nothing better to do. Except for them, this unavail unavailability of other activities is permanent, um, is chronical. They might have a disability that prevents them from getting out of the house. They might just be scared of getting out of the house for all these things that they see in the news. Um, so as a result, they don't get out much. They don't see that many other people in their lives. And they have so much unstructured time every single day. So their primary motive is contextually oriented, because there's a lack of other activities. Um, but their stance towards pleasure and usefulness is a bit complicated. Um, on the one hand, games are extremely useful for them. They're a hobby. They're uh, their source of social interaction, mainly through the internet. But on the other hand, um, they're also the only fun that they typically have in the game, uh, in, the, in the day. So it's very difficult to verify what really is most important and what dominates the other. Um, but what do they play? Um, that's much clearer. They typically look for games that um, are all about social interaction, because um, they don't get to meet a lot of people in real life. So as a result, you'll see online casual games. As long as it has a chat box, they might get interested in it. Um, but also Second Life, uh, MMORPGs. All right, moving up to people who play for the games themselves, as opposed to the activities that are around them. Value seekers play in function of learning. They are all about the cultural relevance of games. They feel games are great works of art, like myself. Um, for this group, games are just another gateway into their bigger interests in life. So as a result, they play for the content of the game, for the games themselves. And this content just happens to be very meaningful to them, because it's a part of their, their bigger interests. However, um, they don't necessarily, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, for this group, it's all about self-cultivation, really. And the games that they like to play reflects this. They love to play war games. They love to play historical simulations. They love to play flight simulators, and so on. And civilization, I've met so many people who would love to play civilization in this group. So those are the value seekers. Moving to the last group, the ludophiles. Um, ludophiles are people who are extremely passionate about, about, uh, extremely passionate about playing in general. They um, play everything. Um, they absolutely love to play, and even things like booking a last-minute flight is a game for them. Um, so as a result, their, pl their primary motive is contentual. They play for the games themselves, um, and they will play everything that just looks fun to them. 
Now, that also means that they play everything that is really hard to put your finger on it. But in this, this is the group where you will typically find a lot of people who will also look for more niche kind of games that aren't uh, that common. So I went with The Secret World because I had a couple of people um, who were pretty much into that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about The Secret World later on if you have no idea what that game is about. So, and that's the player classification for older adults. Um, I do not have percentages to stick on this. I know people in sales always want to get the percentages, but for me, it's more about showing you the variety that is out there. Um, what I can tell you, though, is that, um, time wasters, in my opinion, are, are, are the biggest group right now. But the more uh, we get people who grow up with games getting old, the, the smaller the time wasters is going to be relatively in relation to the others. All right. Um, now, I hope that this illustrates how we need to think beyond a single type of older adult. Um, it's a myth. There's not, no such thing as just the older player. There, just in this classification, we already have five different people. I'm sure you can expand upon this as well. Um, but above all, I want to bring your attention to this because um, it illustrates how important context is to older adults. The context of a time waster, of a freedom fighter, of a value seeker, it, it's different. They all have games embedded in a different way in their life. So this answers that thing that I was talking about in the beginning. We need to make sure that games still fit in their lives because th these things change. And I'll illustrate that um, actually with the next design recommendation. You really want to design for a rich life history. These are people that have lived an extensive life. I mean, you know, they're 60 plus years old. Um, so they have a whole bunch of past experiences, and those experiences will influence how they look at your game. So my colleague Julie Brown is a gerontologist, and she has developed this model for games and older adults. Um, she calls it the life course theory about digital gaming. And it goes a little bit like this. First, you notice that older adults have different motivations. I, you know, I'm thinking that's fairly straightforward now. I've been talking about motivation for quite some time now. Second, though, she talks about ability to play. And I know I've talked about accessibility early, but this also means having the time to play. You know, some, I mean, a lot of older adults have a lot of activities in their lives. It also means having money to play. Not everybody has a huge retirement. Um, so. Ability matters as well. And that's where we start to diverge from younger audiences. For younger audiences, there's less variety, um, I would argue, in ability than for older adults. So that gives us an x axis and a y axis. There's also a z axis, a 3D model, um, which stands for experience. And Julie uses this as a measure of the experience that people have playing games. I would argue that you can also look at it as life experience and everything that just comes into it. And that's where I see a huge disconnect with younger generations, because older adults have a lot more experience in life. So as a designer, you want to keep tap of these things, of all three domains, um, as opposed to just focusing on, mo on motivation, what typically happens with younger audiences. And what's more important is people can be at different points of these boxes at different times of their lives. Um, say you're 45 years old, you find out about Farmville on Facebook because your friends introduce you to it. Um, that means you don't have that much experience playing games, probably. Your motivation to play games might be really low because you haven't really played a lot of games in your life. Um, and your ability to play games, you're not really a pro gamer just yet. Right. So that's box number one. Um, but we're moving on through time. A couple of years later, you've been loving Farmville, but you're like, I'm kind of done with Farmville. And you learn about Second Life, because it kind of taps into similar motivations. It's about creativity. It's about expressing yourself. And at this point, you have become much more of a stereotypical gamer. You've gained experience playing games. Your motivation has changed. You're way more motivation, motivated to play these things. You spend lots and lots of time playing Second Life. And your ability, I mean, you're, you're running around in a 3D world all of a sudden. Your abilities have gone up, too. But then something bad happens. You grow older, let's say, five more years. And at this point in time, um, your husband gets a severe medical condition, because you're both growing older. Um, and that means that your time to play, your ability to play, really, just gets limited severely. Um, and that means that you can't be online anymore when your friends on Second Life are online. So this has a big impact on how you can actually play these games. And you decide, well, I still love to play games. I'm still on the far right of motivation. So you just end up playing Microsoft Solitaire um, whenever your husband doesn't really need you to do anything for him. So um, people transition from one box to another. So keep in mind here, older adults have full and rich lives. And be aware that all these past experiences add up. And they can help generate interest into new ones. And that brings me to my next point. Because due to these rich lives, older adults want mature content, games for grown-ups. Um, and by that, I don't mean this. Let's, 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 let's just work on that, shall we? So instead of intense violence, how about we do innovative gameplay? 
Instead of sexual themes, how about we do thought-provoking themes? Instead of strong language, meaningful dialogue. Instead of blood and gore, let's do aesthetic experiences. And that's what I mean with mature uh, content. So for a 14-year-old, or for some 14-year-olds, you know, great innovative gameplay might be exactly the same as intensive violence. Um, but that's definitely not the case for um, more mature people. Um, and while we have a lot of great power fantasies there, uh, you know, uh, I'm not really bashing on them, but the vast majority of games still struggle with dealing with anything that's genuinely uh, mature. Just think about how the theme of Lost is dealt with in you know, your average first-person shooter game. People just get killed all the time and nobody really seems to matter, uh, seems to mind. So on average, you will find that older adults prefer softer and smarter content over faster and aggressive content. Um, that's also true for media preferences like TV and so forth. So a quick pro tip here. Um, most of you here are probably expert gamers, so what might seem to be a dumb casual game to you as an expert gamer can actually trigger this, can actually be inno innovative gameplay for older adults that don't play that much, um, for a time waste for a freedom fighter. Second, I'm not saying that we don't already have games like this. I mean, we have a lot of really great games, and in particular indie games. I'm a huge fan, obviously. And I've tried these games. I, I, I meet with a, a group of older adults every two weeks, and we play games together. Um, and I've, pl I've tried some of these, like Papers, Please, and that went really well. And why shouldn't it, you know? Papers, Please is a great puzzle game. It's embedded in a social realist uh, novel. It has innovative gameplay and all of the things that I was just talking about. And I think that's really a key point, because I think that we need to curate and market indie games to older adults. It's such a great fit, and it might help some of you indie developers out there that are trying to, su to survive the sales slums that we are currently seeing. Um, so that brings me to another point. Imagination matters, which is great if you're making indie games, because multiple studies have found that older adults do not really care about graphics that much. They care about the fantasy more than the visualization. If you think that's weird, well, think about it this way. What if you've grown up reading books all your life? That's how you interact with media. So um, it's the same with video games for older adults. Anybody remember Spitfire Attack for the Atari 2600? Here's some gameplay footage. Um, can I get the audio really quick? Yeah. All right, that's enough, thank you. Um, so this was pretty impressive in 1983, um, but here's why I'm showing this to you and why I needed the audio. Um, this is a quote from one of the participants in my research. First paragraph is about it's meaningful to him. He wanted to be a pilot. Second paragraph is about it's an aesthetic experience. You know, that simmering little sound for him made him feel like he was actually flying the plane. If you play this game, I mean, the sound effects is pretty awesome. Um, third, it's all about imagination. It's not about fancy graphics. Um, Imagination, imagination will trump graphics every time for older adults. Here's another quote. Um, this comes from Francis, who is a huge Age of Empires 2 fan. Um, and he talks about, I don't want to spend that much money on games. Um, 25 bucks is kind of his max. Um, but he finds that most of them are way too detailed. And it gets in the way of what he wants from games. So you do not necessarily need to spend a huge budget on your realistic graphics if you're making games for older adults, because they like having room for imagination especially when these games tie into their bigger interests and their life history. And that brings me to another design recommendation. You want to design for crystallized intelligence. So what does that mean? Well, there's two kinds of intelligence that matter. Um, well, when we're talking games and older adults. <laughs> um, first off, there's fluid intelligence. And fluid intelligence is really the kind of intelligence that's, about, uh, that's not dependent on your past. It's things like your reaction speed, your perceptual speed, your pattern recognition, your problem-solving ability even. And research shows that these peak in young adulthood, like this. And then they will decline. And you know, lots of games for older adults are all about that decline. But there's also crystallized intelligence. And that's the kind of intelligence that doesn't rely on your past. It's things like vocabulary, reading comprehension, the application of your skills and knowledge to solve problems. And what does the research show? Well, these things actually peak during your old age. So while it's important, um, as a game designer to provide the accessibility accommodations for the decline in fluid intelligence, you could also look at it in a different light and like, no, I'm going to make games that are really good at um, doing crystallized intelligence. And you know, I, I looked for two examples, um, but I, you, there's many, many more. But for example, Synonymy um, was in, in the Experimental Gameplay Workshop, I think, last year. Um, brilliant word game. It's about challenging your vocabulary by finding the shortest distance between two, two words based on their synonyms. 
Um, really beautiful game. It's all about having a very rich vocabulary if you want to be good at this. I'm not a native speaker. I'm sure you figured it out by now. This is a really hard game for me. Um, but my older adults, they're very good at it. Um, the secret world next to it is uh, an MMORPG, and um, it offers these investigation missions. So like a typical MMORPG, you, you go around the world and you have your own character and everything, but in these investigation missions, you need prior knowledge to complete them because they're basically like these puzzles that um, are all about how smart you are, really. Um, and it has nothing to do with hack and slash kind of gameplay. Um, so these are two games that require the use of crystallized intelligence, and there are many more. I mean, just at this conference alone, I'm sure you've seen her story. I'm sure you've uh, heard about Alpha Bear by now. Um, those are games that do this really well, too. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have more of them, and uh, maybe ones that are more designed towards older adults uh, as well. Um, now, this doesn't mean that you can't use fluid intelligence when designing games for older adults. Remember the Track Mania guy? That was all about fluid intelligence, and you can definitely train it. Um, it's just that most games out there are all about fluid intelligence and rarely about the crystallized intelligence, unless we're talking about you knowing how a gamepad works from playing other games or uh, video game culture and history. So let's move, on, let's move on to the multiplayer. When it comes to social play, the biggest thing that you need to do is help older adults find the right player. That's the biggest complaint that I get in all the research that I do. Older adults want adults to play with. They hate to play with pubescent uh, gamers that are just, you know, the gamers gay thing. I, yeah, I know some people know what I'm talking about. Um, in fact, one of my participants, who was not Robert actually, he was in a guild, and these guys specifically sought out the most obnoxious teenagers that they could find. They were a bunch of 50 plus year olds, just to show them a lesson in World of Warcraft. <laughs> so maturity matters for older adults who play online. And there are other factors as well, you know, language, you want to do localization, um, especially you know, if you're dealing with older adults from different countries, they don't speak English as well um, as well. People like myself do. My grandma doesn't speak English. Um, and of course, it's more fun if people are at the same level, but it's also true for younger people. Now, for women um, older players, there is another story that's also really familiar. Harassing women is something of all ages. Um, so that's something that we need to be aware of as well. You will see this issue just as much if you talk to 50-plus-year-old uh, female players and if you talk to 20-plus-year-olds, um, which is awful. Maturity doesn't mean your age, you know. Anyway, so here's my final recommendation that I've got for today. Um, design for intergenerational and other social forms of play. Of all the benefits that games have for older adults, the social ones are definitely the best ones. They're the top ones, in my opinion. And I, I've worked on this Nintendo Wii game myself that was about intergenerational uh, play, and it was simply amazing. You know, not necessarily about the quality of the game, but seeing these two generations collaborate and compete, not just collaborate, but compete as well, it's amazing. Um, and as a game designer, there are so many awesome challenges in there, because their skill sets are so different. Um, and I think there's not that many companies that I'm aware of that really hone in on this thing, even though it's so powerful. Um, if you want older adults to play with their younger family members, this is a really good way to do it. Um, and a simple and effective way to facilitate this um, is what I call prefer, uh, no, sorry, vicarious play. Vicarious play is when one player does the controls and the other helps to think along to solve puzzles. And if you played adventure games a lot, I'm sure you are aware of this. Uh, Day of the Tentacle or any other kind of adventure game is really good at this. I have a lot of participants who talked about how much they love to play these games with their kids, and the kids would do the controls, and they would just help them with the puzzles. Um, and sometimes even with younger kids where they do the controls and the kids try to help with the puzzles. Um, and this is a very popular way to play. But I don't see a lot of games that are actually really trying to do this. It's actually really rare to find that. Um, I'm thinking that's why Mario Galaxy is on there. Mario Galaxy had this Wii Mode feature for a second player who could pick up some of the coins. I mean, that's just all you need to do. Do something that, so that the, the second player doesn't need um, advanced controls, but he can also, or she can also interact. Um, and this is an extremely powerful motivator as well. If you really want older adults to start playing your games and you're looking for a way to get into it, I would say go intergenerational. Um, really go for it, because in video game adoption, as we call it, um, it's so often that the younger family members get the older ones to play if they're not playing already. So anyway, um, that's all for now I've got in terms of design recommendations. Um, it's somewhat just the tip of, a, of, of, of an iceberg, but I think it's a really good starting point, and I'm really happy to share this with you. Um, I do have some final comments, though. First off, this needs to change. 
Um, if you want to address this target demographic, you need more 50 plus year old game developers. It's it's simple as that. Um, so do something about this. And I know it's not just you know about age. There are some other constraints there as well, but this needs to change. Um, second, I want to highlight two initiatives that I think are awesome. Um, the AARP, or the Association for Retired People, has millions of members, um, and they have partnered up with HEVGA, uh, that is an association for all the higher education programs and games, and the Entertainment Software Association, to do a national game jam on um, social connectedness for older adults. I mean, how awesome is that? Um, so if you know students, tell them about this, because the prizes, as you can see on the slide, are really awesome as well. And I think this can really make a difference in this community. Um, so talk to me if you want to hear more about that, or just email Mike Hughes, who's on the, side, on the slide. Um, second, there is the Gerontoludic Ludic Society. Now, this is an association that I'm affiliated with myself. We design and we study games for older adults. And right now, this is mainly an academic party. But we would love to have a connection with industry people and have you guys be part of the dialogue. Um, and if, you know, if you're like, well, that's nice, but I'm not that interested into it. Me and my colleagues, we work with older adults a lot. If you want your indie game uh, play tested, or your AAA game even, if you give us a couple of keys, we'll have some older adults play tested for you. Um, and finally, I have one personal note. So even though you know, I, I think I've been pretty critical at times in this, pre in, in this presentation, which is a good thing in my opinion, but I really think that there are some amazing games out there already. And I'm a big fan of everybody um, in this industry, even if you are developing brain games. Um, I honestly think that games really have never been this awesome before in any given uh, day and age. And I often wish that I had cool games like the ones we have today and all these game engines when I was a kid. So with that in mind, um, it's not that surprising that there are actually a lot of amazing games out there that fit the ideas that I've been talking about. Nonetheless, I hope that I've been able to demonstrate today that the design space for older adults offers many, many more challenges and opportunities than what's happening right now. So I would just love to invite you to explore it further with me and to make some meaningful games for older adults. Thanks so much, GDC. So how are we doing on time? <laughs> Oh, I did it perfectly. All right, I've got 10 minutes for questions. And there's a microphone right there. Hi. <clears throat> Have you uh, heard about the work that um, Adam Ghazali was doing with uh, NeuroRacer yes. and uh, Achille? And uh, do you think, I mean, I, they're, they're trying to get <laughs> FDA approval for games as right. treatment. Uh, do you have any opinion about whether that's a feasible thing? Yeah, I, I think they're. I think they're doing really great work. Um, I'm. You know, I have a lot of colleagues who are neuroscientists, but I'm not one of them. Um, my understanding of, of, of NeuroRacer um, comes down to that they have been able to see some transfer from a game that was very specifically designed for this purpose to some psychological tests, and I believe that they were also done on computers as well. So it's still for me the question of having actual transfer is still pretty much open, but. You know, like I said, I, I, I'd rather have people not quote me on this because I'm not a neuroscientist. Um, but I think they're doing some wonderful work there. Um, and I think that's about as far that my expertise allows me to talk about that specifically. Okay, thank but you. thank you for the question because I think NeuroRace is something that is interesting to look into for people. Thank you. Hi. Do you have uh, an example or two of uh, games for seniors that were financially successful and what kind of uh, uh, business model uh, were they using? <laughs> I wish I did, but um, I am a professor. <laughs> <laughs> I have the luxury of not having to sell games every day. So um, I, yeah, I, I, I don't really have anything that I can share uh, about that with you. I'm sorry. But um, if anybody does, um, you know, we're going to go to the wrap-up run later on. So I'd love to hear about that. My question is kind of similar. I was wondering if you had any context to add about marketing and how to reach this audience and what um, they would use. Yeah, I think I do really quick. I mean, I don't have any business models or sales figures for you, but um, in terms of how to reach this audience, I think I've actually still have like one of the backup slides that didn't make it into the presentation. Um, let's see if it comes up. What's this? Yeah. So. Um, with regards to marketing, I think it's really important that you mention your accessibility features. Um, I think that's the biggest thing for accessibility, actually. It's often very hard for older adults to know 
how hard it's going to be to um, play a certain game. And sometimes, you know, before Steam allowed you to return games, you bought it, you own it. Um, in the two studies that I've already mentioned, and well, the presentation is based on way more studies than just that, but um, my eye happened to fall on these while I was prepping it. Um, so you can see the numbers there. Forums are important. Um, advertising, much less. Um, in, in terms of forums, there is this forum called theoldergamers.com, T-O-G, that has a lot of um, older players. Now, they define older players as starting at you're older than, I believe, 25. But they obviously have a lot of 50-plus-year-olds amongst their members because of that as well, because, you know, 50-plus-year-olds don't want to play with people that are too young or immature. Um, and like I've been saying as well, curation is just highly important. Um, you know, there was, whenever I talk to older adults, they're like, wow, these games that you show me, where can I find these? I'm like, well, I can find these because I am so literate in this, you know, in this field, in this industry. But if you're not, it's just hard because they just open like IGN or something and it's just, you know, the visuals are not appealing to them. Um, I've, I've, I've done a presentation in which I had a slide where I just took like the three biggest game sites, like, look, this is like women that are very scantily clothed. So that's already, for older adults, a thing that they're not that interested in. Well, I'm sure some are, but <laughs> it's not something that I find on average. Let me just put it like that. So I think it would be an awesome idea if, you know, in the websites. I know, for example, that the AARP has, um, they have a games page, and they have more than a million hits every day. Um, it's the biggest page on their website. So older adults are craving to find games, and they struggle finding them. So if you're a journalist, this is something that could be the next big thing. I mean, I know it's going to be the next big thing, but it is going to be something that's going to be very relevant. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Uh, I, I know most of the stuff you showed were for the PC. Uh, right. I'm an indie dev. We're just a team of two, but we've been full-time for like five years. And right. um, probably 70% of our market are older people, uh, seniors, uh, right. 50 and up. And um, I, I noticed you only mentioned one game, uh, Synonymy. I, I'm glad you showed that because we're mostly word games, right. and uh, it's been very good for them. And uh, we found that they, a lot of them, enjoyed how it was intergenerational because we make, uh, we use a lot of idioms and those quotes, so they're able to talk to their children and explain yeah. and grandchildren why why it exists. So I was just wondering. Um, for, for, for word games, it's, it's mostly time waster, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Would you think, how, how big a chunk can it be for the, for the ludophile and for right. the, uh, yeah. I love that question. Thanks so much for asking it. Um, so from my perspective, it would be, you know, if you're, if you're making like um, a bookworms adventure type of word game or something that's, that's really casual, you're, you're at the bottom uh, three yeah, yeah. classifications. And actually, the Freedom Fighters would love the, the bookworm adventures type of game. Uh, for time wasters, if you're more like a Scrabble type of experience. Um, if, I think if you want to ap appeal to the value seekers, I think games yeah. like Synonymy actually would do a good job because you know, it's innovative. The higher you get the innovation, the higher you can make it, you know, have the player have a sense of cultural relevance of this game, like this is something like nothing before. Then you get into that kind of an area. For the ludophiles, they'll play anything. I mean, if they're traveling, they'll play the casual games too. They're the easiest uh, group to, to market to, I guess. So yeah, no, that's actually a really good, and I think it's just, you know, an interesting design problem, and it depends on who you are as a designer. I think every game designer in this room, there is an older adult um, there is a type of older adult that would love to play the games that you are making. I'm absolutely sure about that. So um, it's just a matter on how you approach them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There, I was wondering if I could get a little bit more clarification about something you said about halfway through um, about the aesthetics for uh, older adults. You split them into non playing and and active yeah. players. Um, what, is there healthy overlap between those aesthetics? Is there. Um, or, or I, I didn't really understand the, the distinction, nor the uh, like how, how much, yeah, how much yeah. there was. Between no, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you asked that as well, because I mentioned that specific. I, I think you know, sometimes you're an academic and you're constantly having to play that little game. So I, I decided to clarify, but I don't think it matters that much. It's not like if you're going to make a game about self-cultivation that you're targeting yourself towards non-playing older adults. I'm just mentioning here that it's derived from people who didn't play games, because there might be a bias there in some way. Um, I personally don't think there is. So I, my advice is just don't really look that much at where they come from. Um, just try to, you know, these are ways to 
maybe think about games in a different way. Like, look for an aesthetic that you would typically not think about. Like, how can my game trigger nostalgia, or how can I make it more about giving something back to society? Or, um, but I don't think you should look at it that much. Um, maybe I'll just take it out next time I ever, you know, do a similar presentation because I can see now how it can be confusing. <laughs> That's great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, one more. Well, we have a wrap-up room later on, so I'll happily address your questions there if you want. But I'll do one more. Fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. A game developer who has been making games for 50 plus for the past 18 years. So, and and I found that a lot of your research is absolutely true in the games that I'm making. Right. There's one thing that I wanted to ask you uh, is about the community aspect of the games. It's absolutely right that. It, it, even a simple chat box makes a huge difference. Yes. You have the same game with the same mechanic, and if it has a chat box, it will be 20 times more successful with this, with this audience. Have you um, done some research in terms of the preference of the players in terms of uh, having a chat box, a, a breathing chat box versus uh, a, a team speak uh, type of, of uh, room or a Skype type of room? The reason why I'm asking is because it has um, a, two different forms of communications at the end of the day, not just uh, right. of the fact of the technology, but also of the form of communication and interaction. Is there a particular preference uh, among 50 plus in terms of one or the other? Have you done any research on that? Well, um, I personally, I mean, that would be something more in terms of human computer interaction. I've not done that kind of research myself. Um, you know, what I could answer to that question is, well, you know, if you're looking at value seekers and ludophiles, um, theme speak type of things actually come into the picture because um, they are much more familiar with gamer culture, so they will pick up on, right. you know, VOIP. Um, if we're thinking at um, the, the compensators, it, it's kind of a mixed bag. There are some people, when they're in the MMORPGs or if they're playing over Steam, they will use the voice chat after they really get to know somebody. I remember having some older adults um, that were reluctant to actually use VOIP until they met, you know, you, they knew people really well, uh, which is not an unfamiliar thing with younger audiences either. Um, so there's a couple of things that you can just say based on those uh, player types. It's, it's different for those player types, but I haven't really done any very specific usability kind of research uh, on it because it's simply not my field. Um, you know, this is actually games and aging. It's, it's, it's a budding academic field, but it is a huge area to do research in, obviously. Um, what I would recommend is um, there's the, the Gerund Ludic Society that I've shown you at the end. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can give you a card if you want to. Yep. Um, so they have a mailing list, and that would be a perfect question to just drop in that mailing list, and I'm sure one of the HCI specialists will pick up on it and, and provide you with a better answer, because I'm sure there's research like that out there. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, guys.